Hello everyone, this is Sebastian McMahon from IA Financial Group and I'm back with another weekly economic review, this time for the week ending July 2nd, 2021. So uh, we are entering the second half of the year, uh, but this is the start of the summer, so it's always a bit quieter in the news and in the markets. So this week I thought I'd take time to go into a few uh, structural elements, but mostly take a look at the, the planet, some regions that we don't talk uh, as often as in the past, uh, like Japan, for example. So I thought I might uh, dig a bit into that. And this week, as was announced last week, I'm I'm uh, doing this by myself. Our chief economist is not uh, with us uh, uh, this week. Uh, so I'll cover both the economy uh, and the markets. So let's start with a look at this week's markets at the close on a Thursday. But uh, the markets were closed in Canada on Thursday, so the Canadian figures there are as of uh, Wednesday. So uh, the bond market was positive positive after three days in Canada, 0.76% for the long index, still deep uh, negative territory year to date. Uh, the TSX was negative after three days, but as I am recording this on Friday morning, uh, prior to market open, we are seeing signs of uh, uh, ends of a strong opening on the TSX. So probably when you look at the figures at the end of the day, it could have turned to a positive. Um, the S&P 500 was uh, positive by above 2% on the week uh, in Canadian dollars. NASDAQ 2, EFI down 0.2, emerging markets still positive 0.44. Um, the price of oil uh, above 75 bucks a, a, a barrel for um, the first time since 2018, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, strong momentum here. We're seeing bottlenecks. We're seeing uh, a return to um, to real life. So people are driving their car a bit more. So pushing price uh, higher for oil. Um, uh, the, the US dollar was very strong this week. There is uh, some short covering. Everyone was negative on the US dollar structurally, and we are too. But in the short term, at some point, positioning can become stretched, and we're seeing a, a a rebound upwards so that that pushed the Canadian dollar lower, euro lower and the price of gold lower. So uh, vaccination before we go into the data, so still going strong. Uh, Canada's performance remains stellar. We are number one in the world uh, now, so that's a very good news. And 29.1% um, of the Canadian population has had two doses now. Uh, we are getting into the top, uh, the top uh, echelon here for the second dose. And at this pace, uh, if we continue like this uh, at the end of July or somewhere, or somewhere in August, the share of Canadians that have two doses will probably be higher than in the US. Uh, so uh, that's uh, quite a milestone here, uh, given how far back we were only a few months back. So uh, very good news here that allows for the reopening of the Canadian economy uh, in a very orderly way. So um, as I said, I want to dig into a few structural elements this week. So first, uh, Many uh, anecdotes in the news uh, recently about how uh, costly it is to ship containers worldwide. And of course, if it's really costly to ship containers, that means that the price of pretty much everything that we buy, every every goods that we buy, uh, should reflect that because this it'll trickle down in the price all the way to the consumer. So you have the composite line, which is the dark blue one, which is in the middle of this chart, 8.1K. Uh, this is the price. It, it, Cost to ship a container on average in the world. As you can see, this is a far above the $1.5 to $2,000 um, level that we were looking at uh, in 2020 and before 2020. So the price of shipping is uh, much higher. So again, bottlenecks. Everyone has a very full uh, backlog of orders and they want to be first uh, when they to get uh, their materials or their stuff to sell to consumers. So everyone's putting pressure. So if you want to have it first, you need to pay up. Um, so uh, this this is another element that that makes us think that we will be seeing a bit more inflation maybe than uh, the Fed thinks. It might be a bit less transitory than it thinks to could last for a, a little while longer. Um, so we'll see where we end up. But uh, here, if we have that, that means that uh, 
global economy is doing very, very, very well. So that's uh, the, 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 this is a natural conclusion. So if we look at the current state of the global economy, here are PMI indices for uh, the main regions of the world. Uh, remember, PMI indices are a survey of purchasing uh, managers. So it's a purchasing manager index, ask them many, many questions and um, if things are going better this month than the month prior, then the index is above 50 and the higher it is, well, the better uh, things are going for, for all of the businesses that are surveyed. So when we are at uh, 60 and above, uh, this is a very, very strong reading uh, historically, and we see a lot of uh, 60 plus around the world. So the US is leading the way on services, of course, it is uh, reopening much more aggressively than elsewhere. So services are pushing uh, manufacturing a bit uh, stronger in Europe. Um, services are a bit behind, but still they're close to 60. So that's very strong too. And on the right, you see that Japan is more of a mixed bag. And I think I don't remember uh, speaking about Japan in here in these reviews since this, the beginning of COVID. So as I thought we might as well give it a quick look. So retail sales and export are picking up nicely in Japan. Remember that Japan is still uh, one of the biggest economies in the world. Uh, retail sales are rebounding. There's a, it's a year over year. So of course there's a base effect at, at work, but uh, still it's a good sign to see that consumption is, uh, is rebounding. Although on the left, you see that consumer confidence remains under pressure. So we're not out of the woods yet. And there's uh, some reluctance on a vaccination in Japan too. So so uh, there is a risk that uh, Japan is left behind. But when you look at the uh, the hard economic data, like on the right, the exports, uh, exports are really booming. And uh, now uh, they're exporting a lot of technology, cars too. So that's a good sign for the global economy. So Japan is a bit of a mixed bag, but it is a good barometer of how things are going around the world, especially the exports component. And it is sending some positive, although cautious uh, signals. So that's for Japan. Europe up now uh, the surprises remain largely positive and confidence is rebounding we as economists we like to look at the confidence uh, at the surprise index rather on the size uh, on the on the left side here so uh, this is an index from Citigroup. So what they do is they look at the consensus for all of the economic indicators that we discuss here every uh, every week that we look at on a, on a daily basis. And uh, they look at the expectations and then they look at uh, the number that really comes out, so reality. And if reality is above expectations, well, that's a positive surprise. If it's below, that's a negative surprise. And uh, what we do know is that things are getting better, better, in Europe, uh, expectations are getting higher and higher and still the surprises, the beats remain as strong as before. So that means that expectations are having a hard time catching up with reality. So that's a very good economic environment that you are in where you're uh, facing these kinds of numbers. So surprises remain very good and this is impacting consumer confidence on the right. Uh, as you can see, consumer confidence has crashed uh, in early in the COVID phase. After that, it was going sideways for a good bit all the way to early 2021 and then started picking back up with vaccination and with better economic data. So uh, we like what we're seeing now in Europe. We know that the stock market is very attractive in Europe. It's it's cheap compared to the US. And if you do have uh, economic traction and better earnings and more confidence, that could be a very good sign for things to come for the European stock market. And now closer to home, the US 850,000 jobs were added in June. Uh, as you can see here, the US line is longer than the Canadian line because we did not get the labor report for Canada uh, today. It's going to be next Friday. So now we have one, one, one more month of US data than Canadian data. But what we do know is that 70% of the lost jobs have been regained in the US, uh, lagging Canada at 81%. But uh, now the trend is pretty strong in the US and we are expecting more and more jobs to be added uh, every month. So uh, we could have a few good positive surprises there. Uh, 
we know that uh, the unemployment rate even picked up a little bit higher. The participation rate is is good. People, uh, the prime age workers are getting back to work, uh, at least to searching for work. So that's uh, another uh, good sign. And we're not yet seeing a strong wage inflation. Uh, it's how the, the wage inflation figures are held back by the fact that service sectors uh, are, are where most of the new jobs are added and they're less paid than the average worker. So that means that it it just tilts the average uh, growth rate to lower for wages. So we're not there in the land of um, of seeing wage inflation being a huge risk for inflation uh, for goods inflation. But uh, this is one thing that we will be keeping a very, very attentive eye on over the next few uh, months. And uh, many signs are pointing towards uh, very strong jobs growth ahead. On the left, you have the job openings index. So as you can see, it tends to track pretty well the payroll employment. Uh, but right now, it's not the question of demand. It's a question of supply of workers. Uh, businesses are willing and able to hire. Many jobs are open, but they can't fill them because people are either while well, waiting for a better opportunity in the sector that they want with the, 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 the salary that they want, or they're afraid of COVID, or they are waiting for a school to start again uh, more steadily in uh, in September. Uh, they're waiting for the checks from the government to stop coming in because now they're getting paid sometimes more to stay at home than to go back to work. So uh, when this ends, we'll be seeing a convergence of these two lines on the left-hand chart, and we could see a lot of jobs being added to the U.S. economy. And on the right, consumers see that. It's an indicator, the, 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 the blue line, the purple line here, a uh, conference board index of job, jobs are hard to get less jobs are plentiful so the two two questions that are asked in a survey and now it's uh, very easy it seems to to uh, get a job and at some point as you can see this is a very strong leading indicator of the unemployment rate so it's pointing towards an employment rate that could fall all the way to below four uh, percent rather quickly so uh, we'll see what uh, happens but probably uh, through the summer months and then an acceleration in the fall should see a very very strong labor market in the u.s and now finally canada a historical perspective of of GDP in recessions, uh, we had this uh, a pullback of 0.3% of GDP month over month in April. That was uh, much better than expected. Expectations were from minus 0.8%, but still the third wave med led to a contraction of the Canadian economy. After that, now that we are in the reopening phase, uh, we should see a stronger reacceleration all the way to the end of the year. While in the US, they did not shut the economy again. And uh, that explains why the US is, the, is about to close the gap here. But the very, very uh, resilient Canadian economy bodes well for, for the future here. So financial markets now, as I said, uh, summer has started. Uh, less activity in the markets and it's uh, here's the seasonality. So seasonality is pointing towards sideways for the S&P 500. Of course, this is just uh, an historical average. Anything can happen. Don't take these. Uh, uh, always take these with a grain of salt, but uh, the sell in may go away uh, crowd. Well, they look at this and it kind of confirms their view. Uh, so in the summer, it's always a good a moment to take some profits to reassess your uh, portfolio, your risk appetite, uh, not to be too overextended uh, during the summer, also not being too uh, cautious either because, um, you know, anything can happen, but uh, it's always a good moment to reassess your view. And here I want to, I wanted to take a few minutes to address a question that I've been asked a few times recently, uh, and I'll shift to this slide for that. Uh, uh, I've had the question about, well, last year in 2020, the economy was bad and the markets were very, very, very good. And we had 72% return on the S&P 500 between March 2020 and March 2021. So very, very strong stock market. And now the economic data is like out of this world and the market starts to go sideways. So why is that happening? The question, the answer, the basic answer is that markets are always forward looking 12 to 18 months. So in 2020, everyone was pricing in the good news that we are seeing now. 
So that explains why markets were strong. And now that we are seeing the good news, well, there's some consolidation, some profit taking, and the, 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 the market or the multiples are actually contracting. And this is very, very natural behavior for the stock market. Year two of a bull market usually looks uh, just like that. So uh, on the left, what you see is that the earnings uh, surprises are very, very strong right now uh, the beat rate is high and the uh, the average surprise the size of the surprise on earnings is uh, 20 25 percent so as you can see the average is seven percent and it was even below that for many many years so uh, businesses are making a lot of profits and on the right this is a chart with the msci world so there is a line this is the performance of the msci world index year over year there you have your like 75 percent return year over year in uh, march the darker uh, shade of uh, blue, this is the price earnings uh, change year over year. So when it, it's positive, that means that it is uh, multiples that are pushing the, the stock market higher, not business earnings, not profits. And the lighter shade of blue is the opposite. It means that earnings are growing. So uh, what you see here is that in 2020, Multiples were pushing the S&P 500. Well, here this is the MSCI World Index uh, higher, while earnings were actually having a negative contribution. So the, the the lighter shade of blue that you see starting in May of 2020, all the way to the right. And now that you've had this strong peak in the stock market, now it's starting to contract a little bit. And as you can see, the earnings are starting to uh, to pick up very very strongly, and the multiples now are contracting. So you're seeing the market as being out of the out of the bear market uh, you have the, the the multiples that are low and then the market becomes very expensive because it's pricing in a lot of things to come and when these things do come then you have the multiples that start to contract and the market then is starting to be led by earnings so by the real news so you're kind of just reconnecting now uh, slowly with the fundamentals and this is exactly the pattern that we saw coming out of the 2008 recession multiples expanded first then economic data came in that was better earnings were better so the market became cheaper and cheaper as it was earnings growth that was driving the market and profits were being taken on winning positions and then at some point it reconnects completely and this is only earnings that are pushing uh, the markets higher uh, in another phase and then you have other phases later in the cycle that we'll discuss when we get there but uh, this is exactly uh, what's happening now so optimism it was multiples that was pushing the markets higher until the markets become becomes expensive. Then some profits are being taken while the economic story unfolds and you still have returns, but less positive returns than in the year prior. And then after that, you have a market that makes more sense because it's really earnings that are driving the market. So we are in this phase now. So that explains why you look at the market and say, well, I would expect a better based on the economic data that I see. Well, it's because it's already priced in and now people are taking their profits on these kind of positions. So I hope it gives some context as to uh, what uh, what's happening here. And uh, I know I might sound like a broken record, but the TSX is very, very cheap compared to S&P 500. And the story I just told here favors the TSX even more because there is less potential for a, contract, a contraction in multiples on the TSX because the TSX is already pretty cheap compared to the S&P 500. So that means it's another advantage that the Canadian stock market has. So right now, in the, the markets that are cheapest compared to the, the, the S&P 500 will be favored by this aspect of second year of bull market and just multiple contraction while we reconnect with earnings. So very positive for the TSX here. And also the rotation from growth to cyclicals, it favors the Canadian stock market, favors Europe. As you can see, these are the inflows to tech stocks. Look at how there was this uh, strong explosion in uh, early 20. 2021, late 2020, uh, of money flowing into tech, and now it's starting to drip out of tech. Rotation uh, is starting to happen again. So there was some consolidation in the last few weeks and months, but we do think that in the second half of this year, uh, there will be more rotation from growth to cyclicals, and that again favors uh, the TSX. So uh, what to watch next week? 
Canada will have our employment report in, in May. We had 68,000 negative unemployment rate was at 8.2%. So we should get some jobs creation in June. So we'll have that in um, next Friday and we'll have the ISM services index also coming out in the US. Uh, so that wraps it up for the week. IA.ca slash economy is your go to web page. Um, if you uh, haven't done so already, you can subscribe to our newsletter. So thank you everyone for following us on a weekly basis. Uh, it's always a pleasure to, uh, to try to make sense of everything that goes on in the, the financial world. And I'll be back again next week with another edition of the weekly economic review.